Let's face it, business technology is frustrating and complex. So how do you make sure it works for your team? To make IT right, start the discussion at go-domain.com. You're listening to Discussions by Domain, a podcast for business leaders. Our discussions may be with people you've probably heard of before, but the majority of our guests are in the trenches, professionals like you and I, with the same challenges and struggles of keeping up in the Northeast. They're implementing strategies, overcoming hurdles. They're leading the fastest growing businesses in our region. My name is Anthony DeGraw, Director of Partnerships at Domain Computer Services and the host of this show. When I'm not talking with business leaders, you'll hear stories from behind the scenes of Domain and the ups and downs of our own growth journey as we intend to take over the world. Just kidding. Well, maybe. Let's get into the show. Welcome to another episode of Discussions by Domain. I'm your host, Anthony DeGraw, and today we have Henna Shah on the podcast. She's going to talk to us about the journey through being or up to being a nurse practitioner, which is super interesting to me because it's not an industry that I know. Uh, And also living on the Jersey Shore, you guys are in Red Bank. We're in Point Pleasant. We're always at the beach. Uh, So we're going to talk about some of the tips that you guys can take out there on practicing safe skincare. Yeah. Is that what we would call it? Safe skincare. Yep. Okay, cool. So before we dive into the topic, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you're up to nowadays. Sure, sure. So um, I'm Henna and I'm a family nurse practitioner. So I specialize in dermatology. So um, I started off my dermatology career working in Princeton um, and then I kind of took a little bit of a, a steering off the pathway and I worked with plastics for about a year to specialize in skin cancer and surgeries. Wow. Um, and okay. now I'm back to what I love, which is general dermatology. And I work in a part of a larger dermatology group in Tom's River. Awesome. So, yeah. Very cool. Uh, we got the Jersey Shore here today. Normally it's like <laughs> Princeton and North oh, Jersey. Okay. So we're, yep. we're trying to bring some people the sunshine, over. Right? Exactly. <laughs> Tell us what a, like a typical day looks like for you. Uh, obviously this is Monday afternoon, so you get to do podcasts, which is pretty cool, (laughs) but no, on a typical day in the office, what does that look like? Right. So, um, I would say my day usually starts at about seven in the morning. I'll start with my first patient and it really fluctuates. It's such a dynamic field. So it can be from skin cancer surveillance, like a full body check. And then the next patient can be acne or a rash, um, a surgery, removing a mole. So it just is very, very dynamic. It changes, um, from one patient to the next. And then I'm there about eight to nine hours a day, some charting in between, but that's yeah. about it. Taking post calls, uh, okay. calling back, you know, test results and things like yeah. that. So, one of the yeah. questions I have is how much is, how much is it you b- kind of building your own brand and practice versus the practice building the practice? Like what what is put on the individual practitioners versus the practice as a whole? I just, sure. I, I'm yeah. interested in that. So I would say the practice as a whole has its name behind it, right? And it's, and it's so, everybody the practices out there they'll advertise as a whole yeah but a part of that there are so many different offices that um you're basically branding yourself you're you're man you know marketing yourself um i would say each patient interaction so about 30 to 40 times a day you're introducing yourself to somebody new you're gaining their trust Um, every patient interaction is important Mm -hmm. and each interaction is an opportunity to market yourself and build trust right um you're re-meeting somebody every 10 to 15 you know 15 minutes a lot of those patients are established over time and they come back to you they like you but every new patient you know you're building their trust you're gaining their trust you're offering them services apart from what they already came in for. Um, Gotcha. um, You can do, some people actually, a part of my practice, like to do social media. Um, I'm not super into that because I like to keep work, work and and my life private. Um, But you can do social media. They have private Instagram or public Instagram accounts where they'll show procedures that they do. So really, you can market yourself as much or as little as you want to. And a lot of that is for the, the practitioner or the physician or anyone to kind of do on themselves at whatever they want. Yeah. You know, they have um, opportunities at fairs and stuff. If we have a booth of ours to pass out business cards, word of mouth. 
Okay. Yeah. So it's a lot. It sounds like the base of it, though, is a lot of the interactions you're having with the patients that are coming through the door. Yes. You're building trust with them. And most likely they're going out to their family and friends of the things they've learned right. that you've taught them. And then, hey, I met with Henna. You should probably go see her. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Or, they'll, you know, I'll have patients come in. Oh, you were highly recommended by my friend, you know, so and so that came in last week to see you. Yeah. And I say, oh, it's awesome. You know, they really liked me and they want to come back. So that's awesome. a, a huge part of it is word of mouth. Um, yeah. And then you have ZocDoc and all those other things so online. Online presence yeah. and stuff. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, sorry. That was a little – I didn't prep her for that one. No, that's uh, okay. But that's just something I, <laughs> I'm interested in. Next question is walk us through the journey to becoming a nurse practitioner. You know, What does that look like from an education, a time commitment? Walk us through that journey. Sure, yeah. So I would say, I mean, it's a time commitment. Um, for me, I feel like I've known you for a really long time and you've only been in school. <laughs> like, that's like, you know what, though? The times go by fast, actually, because yeah. it's been about four years that I've been practicing. Okay. So it's, yeah. it's kind of, it, it, we've known each other for a while now, mm -hmm. but it is. It's a long time. It's a long time. Um, So I kind of knew at an early age that I wanted to be a nurse and an advanced practice nurse. Okay. So it was a little bit more accelerated for me because I knew what I wanted at a young age. I knew where to apply and what I wanted to do. Gotcha. I would say typically it's about a six to eight eight year process of schooling yeah. and then based on what else what field you want to be you're at, you're looking at a couple additional years um fellowship training things like that okay. i wouldn't call it a fellowship it's the physician term but you know more concentrated on the field training things like that gotcha um so for me i did I went into nursing school right out of high school. Um, so I went to University of Michigan. I did four years there. Awesome. I got my Bachelor of Science in Nursing. So there's so many different ways in nursing to, to get a degree, right? But if you want to be an advanced practice nurse, meaning go back and get your advanced practice degree, mm -hmm. You have to have a four-year bachelor um, okay. degree. You can't you can't do it with a two-year degree. Understood. So it's got to be a four-year bachelor of science in nursing. And then um, I worked for about a year in the intensive care unit as an RN just wow. to get that hands-on experience with patients and just interacting and working in a multidisciplinary field because even as a nurse practitioner, even though I am autonomous and I see my own patients and I do my own thing, you still work with, with physicians and surgeons and you need to kind of know how – to communicate, to communicate with them, yeah. your thoughts and be the patient's advocate, right? Yeah. So I did that for about a year and then I applied for graduate school and I got my master's of science in nursing at okay. University of Pennsylvania. Awesome. Um, that was a 16 month accelerated program. Most programs are two to three years. And yeah, there's only two in the so nation. So you, you had like an hour to sleep ah, in it was 16 very, months? It was a lot. It was a lot. Yes. I was fortunate enough to not have to work while I did it. So okay. I was able to, you know, really crunch that in. It was full time. Um, you know, you're going to school four days out of the week. You're doing your rotations in between that or, or adding that in. Um, yeah. And then if you have kids or a family, which luckily I just had my husband so yeah. here at the fiance at the time. So I was able to focus really on that. But most of them are two to three years, depending on if you want to end with your master's or a doctorate. Okay. Um, I didn't go for the doctorate because it's more of a research degree and I didn't feel I needed it you um, for my field. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, it's, it's that's how that's it goes. That's awesome. Yeah. Wow. And so, all right, you finish up there at UPenn, mm -hmm. and what what was after that? Like, what's the first, I guess, job at that point? So you have to take your boards, okay. um, and then as soon as you pass your boards, um, you yeah, you apply for your first job. Which so I am actually by by definition, I'm a family nurse practitioner. Okay. So there are several different kinds of nurse practitioners out there. Um, Family means that I can diagnose, prescribe, treat family medicine and specialty medicine from one year till really birth, really. Okay. Um, but mainly one years old to geriatric. So okay. Wow. Um, and that's my degree. So we, it was a little bit longer. Um, you can do specialty. You can do pediatrics if you wanted to. Okay. There's pediatric nurse practitioners. There's psych. There's adult gerontology. So there's different kinds. Okay. Um, because I'm family, I pass the board to do pediatrics and um, wow. you know, adulthood. Okay. And with that degree, though, I, I mentioned that because to be in a subspecialty, you need to have a degree that allows you to do that. So with family practice, I can do ENT, allergy, GI, dermatology, yeah. whatever. I knew I wanted to do dermatology, so mm -hmm. I just started applying. A lot of people told me, you know, it's hard. You sh you're not going to get in dermatology because it is a tough field. Yeah. Uh, I would say with a dash of luck and perseverance, I got my first job right out of NP school um, 
couple months after my boards and okay. uh, I started working in Princeton. That's yeah. awesome. So I was very lucky. Um, they were a great group and um, I learned everything there. Um, I did about six months of training with the physician and then I started seeing patients on my own. I worked there for a couple of years and then I moved to Red Bank. Yeah. So then I kind of did that switch to plastic surgery to kind of specialize and learn procedures. Um, because I was doing a lot of medical dermatology in okay. Princeton, but I wasn't doing that many procedures. So I worked with him to kind of get my, you know, excisions and surgery, um, s- stitching yeah. and doing all of that. Um, some cosmetics as well. And then I kind okay. of saturated myself and I said, as far as dermatology goes within plastic surgery, I think I've learned what I can learn and I want to go back to dermatology. Yeah. So now here I am. And that's Tom's awesome. River. Yeah. That's such a cool pathway. Yeah. It's so, it's so different than uh, a lot of the stuff that, that a lot of the people we typically talk to, which is cool. Yeah. And why I wanted to bring you in here because I was like, we need to change a pace. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> So good stuff. I guess I would ask the the question about dermatology specifically. Like, what was it that interested you so much in dermatology? So you know, these, there's a saying that like medicine is a form of science and art. It, yes, it, it's both. Yeah. Right. You can learn what you learn in a textbook, but to apply it, everyone has their own touch. I mean, everyone has their own way that they do it. And I don't think that any specialty, in my eyes marries the two so well like dermatology and plastics does. I mean, you really have to know your medicine. You need to know the anatomy. You need to have good surgical skills. You need to have good hands. And and it's an art, right? Yeah. I'm not going to stitch and suture the same way someone else does, right? My technique is different than someone else's. So I think that kind of lured me in a little bit where I'm like, this is not just me prescribing and diagnosing medication. It changes so much. And I can one minute be doing yeah. this and the other minute I've got an explosive thing in my yeah, room going I, on. <laughs> yeah. I'm doing a procedure. I'm like, oh, so it's always changing. And that's what I like. It's, it's fast paced. You have to be on your feet and think on the moment. And, and I've yeah. always liked that. That's why I liked ICU nursing because it was so quick and yeah. I was, I, I want to ask you the question. I don't know if you can answer it. Like what's the craziest thing you saw at the ICU? Oh, or man. Like, and where, wh- what ICU were you at in Michigan? So this was in Michigan. Yeah. Um, yeah, I worked. So I did all my training at University of Michigan Hospital. Okay. And my, but my first position was at Genesis Regional Hospital. So that was about an hour north of where I lived. So I drove okay. an hour into work every day. And it was kind of rural. So the way that it kind of works in, in medicine is if you want to make more money, you go to a place where there's not, especially in Michigan, there's not much um, help, right? Okay. Because now you're that main person. But on top of that, you're, that's you're, you're the, main, you're the person. main person. <laughs> yeah. So I was there and um, I, it, was, it was beginning of my shift and I had a patient that a lot of the, I mean, all of my patients were vented um, in the mm-hmm. ICU. So they had a tube that mm-hmm. went down their throat to help them mm-hmm. breathe attached to a breathing machine, right? Yeah. And with that, you have to really watch them suction out the breathing tubes and, and change out their IVs and do all this. So I, right when I get on my shift, I went to go suction the patient and I noticed a bit of pink froth, almost like Pepto-Bismol that <laughs> was coming Lovely. out. And I was like, it's not normal it's not okay let me yeah. take a look at it and then I was like, maybe it's just clearing it out and it was not i go back in in 10 minutes to suction them again and i get more pink froth now i say pink froth because in nursing and in medicine you should kind of know like pink froth is not a good thing it's something called pulmonary edema okay. which means that they're from the breathing their lungs are are back flowing gotcha. with blood Understood. basically Understood. From, from the heart yeah. so the chamber is not clearing and you're back flowing and so there is blood pooling into their lungs and they're not able to breathe. So that can go from zero to 60 real quick. Yeah. So I had to, you know, kind of, no one was on call. No one was, I was, I had to call the physician and get the orders and and everything. But, you know, being it's nighttime and there's only one physician on call, the whole hospital. Yeah. You guys had a lot of work to do. So, you know, it was, it was crazy. I mean, there's lots of codes and everything that happened, but it's, always okay. explosive things and you were happens, i mean you know? you're yeah no understood <laughs> things are always bursting, yeah, b- bursting. uh and and you were real young at this time i, was really I mean young. real young yes my first what, 22 so, maybe yeah 22 yeah. yes I, I graduated may of 2014 yeah. i was 22 i got my first job in, in august yeah yeah holy smokes no july i think yeah see you right so there it was, it wow was, yeah good for <laughs> you i mean that's like leadership that's everything in like one <laughs> fell swoop it was, uh, I was kind of shoved into things. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. but I, I feel like sometimes that's like the best way to learn. I always say it, uh, like I, I have to remember that like from a, a sales, insurance, IT, cybersecurity perspective, like I was shoved out into the five boroughs in New York, Long Island and Westchester, just like knocking on doors. And like, I, right. it's very hard to duplicate that environment 
in Princeton, New Jersey. It just doesn't happen, right? right? So I always have to go back and be like, oh, that that is a different experience. Like you got to try and find a way to inform these other people of that. And mm -hmm. I'm sure you have to do the same thing. Like yeah. you can't duplicate that experience. No, it, I don't want know. to. <laughs> you don't want to <laughs> either. Um, all right, let's switch gears a little yeah. bit to the Jersey Shore. We got summer coming up. It's a little cold. Some, day, some days are warm. Some days it's cold. I don't know if it's winter or not winter right know, now. It's what really it is. odd. It's First winter, second winter, first, second. Yeah, I don't know what it is. <laughs> I don't think we had first winter yet. Yeah, so I don't know. We'll see. Um, yeah. But what are some things that for people that are going to the beaches and pools and kids, all of this stuff is what we got going on. What are some things we should be paying attention to uh, that I guess is the best proactive, preventative way to cause what walks into your door? Right, right. So I, I have noticed practicing because I practice in Princeton. So now being in the Jersey Shore area, yeah. skin cancers are an all time high there, right? Okay. I mean, almost every person that's walking in there, I'm like, wow, this is, this is a lot of sun damage. So I would say the best thing to do is when you do every day, not even just when you go to the beach, every day, think of it as a second pair of like underwear. Okay, <laughs> you should be putting yeah. on sunblock every single day. Even really? if it's some, yep, not, if it's winter, if it's cold, that, my biggest thing, but it's cold outside. I said, yeah, but it, the sun is still out, yeah. right? We're not po post-apocalyptic. There's yeah. still sun, even if it's cloudy, there's still sun. Okay. It's just that you're not seeing it because the clouds are marring it, right? Yeah. But you're still getting those harmful UVA and UVB rays, right? Okay. So UVA rays are the rays um, that kind of cause there's two rays, right? The UVA rays penetrate from the top layer of the skin into the second layer of skin. Okay. And they cause um, aging, wrinkles, sunspots, melanoma. And melanoma is the big deadly one, right? Gotcha. It's the one that can metastasize and go into different parts of the body. Okay. Um, UVB rays are the ones that just hit the top of the skin. And those are the ones, you know, that cause sunburns and localized skin cancers, such as basal cell and squamous cell skin cancers. Okay. So either way, you, you need to be protecting those because if the sun is out, which is every single day, yeah. you're getting that exposure. Okay. Um, I would say you don't, you know, in the summertime, of course, wear sunblock SPF 30 or higher. Okay. Um, and during the winter times, you don't have to necessarily wear a sunblock sunblock, but you can wear a dual action moisturizer, okay. which is just your face cream. If you noticed, it'll say it's got SPF in it. So SPF 30. So there's so many brands, Aveeno, CeraVe, Cetaphil, so many brands out there now, I think it's more awareness now yeah. that the moisturizer, their daily moisturizer has SPF in it so that you're not feeling like you're putting on sunblock during the day. Some people say, oh, it feels cloggy. You know, I don't like it. Well, there you go. I've yeah. got this that you should put on every day behind the ears, okay. neck, face every day. And then in the summertime, you want to do SPF 30 or higher every 90 minutes. Every 90 minutes. Every 90 okay. minutes. So SPF means sun protection factor. Um, so that just means... I feel like a lot of people don't know this. I'm no, I, 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 of, I don't um, know. Go out there. So if it's SPF 30, say if I were to walk outside and put nothing on, it would take me maybe 20 minutes to get a sunburn, right? A little yeah. bit longer for me, but yeah, <laughs> about yeah, 20 yeah. minutes, Understood. right? That's if you put nothing on. Now, if you put on SPF 30 and you apply it as you're supposed to, meaning reapply it every 90 minutes, yeah. to, you know, to two hours, um, use it as, as directed, you're going to prevent yourself from getting a sunburn 30 times longer. So okay. about 10 yeah. hours to get a sunburn if you're applying it how you're supposed to be applying gotcha. it. Gotcha. So that's what that does. And it really protects you from the sun damage. On top of that, though, it's not an excuse to go toast out in the sun. Um, still wear hats, go underneath the umbrella, go into the shade. It's really important yeah. because I think that's the number one easiest thing that we can do that can really prevent. Help um, out. Yeah, it can really help yeah. out. I've, yeah. I've noticed since I've started completely shaving my head to bald because I just yeah. accepted the fact, <laughs> uh, I, I got to make sure I'm hats. wearing hats because yeah. it, it, I get crushed yes, uh, really well. you got it. So, so. you know, actually, um, a company called La Roche-Posay made yeah. a, you, it's like a, I think it's a UV um necklace and you put it on and it it lights up every time you've had too much uv exposure oh which is really cool for wow. people to be out in the sun all day and and it just kind of says all right it's time for even though you have sunblock on it's you've had enough it's time for you to kind of get in the shade for a little bit and, and cool yeah off, wow really cool. that's really cool we'll yeah. try and find that maybe we can get the link from you yeah i'll see if i can, I can research it. i'm sure i can that's find really it. cool yeah um 
Okay. But, so we got so we got the SPF. We got wear the protective gear, right? Yes. Anything else? Yes. So I know GTL is huge on the Jersey Shore. <laughs> yeah. I know that that's what's that's a gym thing. tan laundry. Gym tanning laundry. You can do the G and the L. Please do the G and the L. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The T can go because tanning is probably the worst thing you can do for your skin. And this is tanning um, in like the tanning, tanning beds. Tanning, in, tanning beds. So that and also tanning in general, but okay, tanning and gotcha. tanning beds. If you were to never go in a tanning bed, opposed to someone that has gone in a tanning bed once, yeah. you're increasing your risk for melanoma by 59%. Holy just one smokes. time before the age of 35. So I have a lot of young patients that have, you know, have yeah. melanoma. And I feel like almost every time, not all the time, but every time I ask almost, they've had tanning bed exposure before 35. Gotcha. So wow. if, if it were my way, we wouldn't even have them anymore. Um, I think yeah. we're trying to ban them, but it's it's not there yet. Um, but it's just a horrible thing to do for your skin. Okay. Uh, there's no such thing as a baseline tan. <laughs> yeah. That's like burning yourself before you burn yourself. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, yeah. It's just not, it's not, it's not healthy. It's, okay. yeah, just, it's pale skin is in. Do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So stay away from the tea. Stay away from, from the, the tea. tea. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Next question I have is like, so so my uh, my family personally, my grandmother uh, and my dad even doing exactly what we were talking to about before we start recording, right? Like mm -hmm. goes and gets spots checked out. Right. Do they do the base test right there? Then if do they have to go deeper? Every all this kind of things. So. What like knowing that that's in line, and I'm sure there's other people out there knowing that that's in my line or in my uh, genetics or whatnot, that not only do they have sun exposure, but they also have the genetics too. Like what should somebody like me be doing? Right. Like I like Randy has to uh, like, I don't know what she has to do to get me to go to doctors because I don't. But anyway, like what should we be thinking about and doing uh, with that in our genetics and family lines? Right. Right. So I think that. um I tell everybody it's kind of like going to the doctor, right? Okay. Um, you go to your primary care once a year, yep. most people do, and you get a checkup, right? You go and they check your breathing, they check your heart, they do blood work to make yeah. sure that you don't have, you know, um, cholesterol or diabetes. But if you don't go, you're never going to know, right? Correct. Most people don't really have symptoms or don't even know how to identify those symptoms until they go to their physician and they check it out. Um, I would say dermatology, people don't really think of it like that, um, but it agree. is, it's a primary care visit. You should go once a year, have a skin check, which is a total body exam where okay. we check every mole on your skin, every spot, um, and not just moles, right? You can have sunspots that aren't supposed to be there or basal cell, which is a skin cancer, precancer spots, all these spots that the average person wouldn't necessarily know how to identify that exactly. on themselves. Yeah. And if you don't go, you won't know. So I would say once a year, get a full skin exam baseline, and then you kind of get a check. You know, okay, these are the kind of moles I made. Yeah. You talk to your provider about that and see what they kind of recommend, what kind of schedule they recommend you to be on. Um, okay. I think everyone should go once a year. If you've had a skin cancer or if you have a family history of melanoma, personal history, Maybe a little bit, yeah, you know, more, more frequently, that. like twice a year. Question yeah. for you: So, so say you do the you do the the check, the full body scan and whatnot, once a year, and you find something like it could be basic and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, by by acting on that finding, how much does that help prevent like a, like a more serious issue? A hundred percent, yes. Okay. So so. Like I said, a skin exam is the best way for early detection and treatment um, and prevention, right? So, yeah, if you were to catch a melanoma, and I, I use melanoma because it's the most aggressive, but even a basal cell or a squamous yeah. cell or a precancer spot, the earlier you catch it, the, you, you take it out and it can be done with and that's it, right? Okay. But the longer you let it stay there, a melanoma can be in situ, which means we caught it in the early stages. We, we cut it out, we do the excision, we check to make sure it hasn't gone anywhere else, and then you go in for your visits. Whereas a more aggressive melanoma that yeah. hasn't been caught in time and treated in time can be deadly. So it's it's a matter of the earlier you catch it, the earlier you treat it, yes, 100% you're better off. The better it's yeah. going to be. Yeah, I need to get on that. Randy, I hope you <laughs> listen to this, his skin exam. <laughs> this episode with Henna. You should text her it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, all right, let's get away from this. What organizations, now you've been Michigan- Pen, right? Yeah. Uh, all over the place a little bit. What organizations have been most influential to you and your career? Yeah. So I would say um, off the bat, of course, the American Academy of Nurse Practitioners is something that any nurse practitioner okay. should be a part of. It's a great support system. It, I, you know, people, unity is the best thing and, and 
numbers speak volumes. So it's just great to have that unified front. But also I would say within the dermatology field though, the American Academy of Dermatology is okay. like the Bible for anybody in dermatology, whether um, physicians are, that's their organization, just like we have the AANP, yeah. the dermatologists have the AAD, and that's where you get your up-to-date, um, you kn- newest updates on treatment, um, new products, uh, new standards of care. Okay. Um, and that's something, they have a journal as well that I read up on that lets me know, all right, we're not doing that anymore. Actually, the newest studies say that this is how we should do things now. Or like we used to do this for so many years, but you know what? We've done a study now that says we don't need to have that blood work anymore for this or how you prescribe okay. it because we don't need to waste you know, insurance money or, or do this. Or we found that the outcomes are better if we do this. So it's a great way to keep up on the newest research. Okay. And every, every provider. Do they have like a, like an annual conference that you guys all go they to? They have an annual conference. Okay. Yeah. That we can go to. And then, um, New Jersey, actually there's so many dermatology conferences. So Mount Sinai is the one that I go to every year. Okay. I try to go to the AAD if I can. Um, yeah. And then there are some other ones too that are more mid-level um, focused, meaning physician assistants and nurse practitioners okay. can go to. But yeah, we we always try to go to at least one or two a year yeah. and, and to and keep, keep up, up to date for that. And they actually have really good patient information um, on their website, the AED. So okay, so like for ever, us to look, yes, check it out and yes. see what's the latest standard, yep. what should we be looking it's out very, for? It's in like layman's terms. It's very simple. It's awesome for understanding. Um, for somebody that's even new to dermatology that doesn't know, or you got a diagnosis and you have no idea what that means. Yeah. Um, you just mean know that they said it's okay and you want to know yourself, you can log on to that website and they have okay. so many things on there. for. Patients. Yeah, no, that's a good resource. Yeah. Uh, who's a mentor or leader that's helped you? So I would say that because I'm a nurse practitioner, I get to work with so many physicians and surgeons and dermatologists, and I can't pick just one because every single one has taught me something so different um, from all the places that I've kind of been to that each and every single person, every dermatologist I work with, every most surgeon I work with has helped me shaped uh, shaped me into who yeah. I am and how I practice and you you know you learn something from somebody and, and you're like that then you put your own flair to it and then you go and say you see something cool that someone else does you're like oh, I never thought to do it that way let me try this way yeah. instead so all of them and we're such great resources to each other I feel like it's really cool to work in an environment yeah that's like great that. okay yeah. I like that answer what advice would you go back and give your younger self now? I'm going to preference this with you had it determined. You were determined yeah. and focused from a young age. But there's going to be other people that are also in that same boat. So what advice would you give your younger self? Yeah, I would say a couple things. One, have patience. <laughs> yeah. It'll happen. Yeah. Um, I think I was a little bit too hard on myself if I didn't get it right the first time or if I didn't do yeah. it perfectly. And and I would say, you know, the older you get, you kind of realize mistakes are going to happen. And that's how you learn to be a better provider and how to be a better practitioner. Um, you know, obviously don't make big mistakes, but yeah. you're, you, it's, you're not going to get a perfect uh, and you're not going to get it right the first time every time. So allow yourself to make some mistakes. It's okay. okay. And then also don't let anybody tell you you can't do it because so many times when I was in school, when I expressed to even my mentors, um, you know, this is what I want to do when I graduate. Oh, well, I don't think you're going to get that job right away in the ICU or I don't think you're going to be able to get into dermatology right away. And Luckily, I had people that were like, just apply. You know, what's going to happen if you just, just do it? If exactly. they say no, they say no. And luckily, I didn't listen and I and I did it that way. But if I had listened, um, I, f- I feel like so many people listen to that. And yeah, you would have just and per- stopped let me yourself. Just, let me just try this first. And if you know you want to do something, just do it. And, and Yeah, I yeah. love that. Yeah. Ty, that's, uh, that's going to be the name of this episode. <laughs> Don't listen to anybody. <laughs> <laughs> no, I do. I do. It's it's so true. That advice yeah. is so true. People get in if, your head. They right? get in your head. You don't take the action. Which re- if you don't take like what is it the ten thousand? Sh- I've taken ten thousand shots and yeah. uh, I've missed every one I've never taken or something like that. Mm-hmm. But uh, anyway, yeah, you got to take it. The worst they can yeah. say is no. Exactly, and just keep and moving. Sh- yep, keep it moving. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, any nonprofits or charities uh, that you support or would like to give some recognition to? Yes, yes. So um, actually, there's a cu- there's two of them that really we we invest a lot of time into. Um, one is the Children's Specialized Hospital. Yeah. Um, so that's uh, Robert Wood Johnson, and they actually help um, children. It's 
similar to St. Jude's, I would say, but more local. Okay. And they help um, with children's hospital bills and just family assistance and, and anything that that child needs so that the family doesn't have to worry about it. They can take care of their child going through That's something awesome. right now um, and, and all that. It's right in New on. Brunswick, right? Yeah. Rutgers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, and the other one, actually, I found out through and I and I got linked to through my husband, um, through Northwestern Mutual is Alex's Lemonade Stand, okay. and that one funds childhood cancer research. And um, we they do a stand every single year and um, really raise a lot of money for them too, which for the children. Yeah, <laughs> what, what I saw about that, I think there's a, I, I feel like I just read an article about a politician that is trying to remove the need for um, you to have some a permit to have a lemonade stand so that kids can do this and mm-hmm. and benefit things and, and it, I don't know if it ties into them but yeah it was like yeah, it's one of those stupid laws that's out there and right. they're like hey let's just get rid of this yeah, so awesome. that kids can do this kind of stuff which is super cool good stuff we covered a lot we did. We any did. uh closing thoughts questions what do you want to leave the audience with even now God. I mean, we, we went over a lot of stuff um yeah. i guess put on your sunblock yeah <laughs> my, my go-to otherwise you know what's funny my younger um my younger audience I was, i'm young too but you yeah. know my younger patients that come in they don't get scared by cancer so if i tell mm-hmm. them don't go tanning you've got to stop tanning immediately you've got to put on your sunblock like well i want to tan i want to you know i want to be tan so they don't get scared by that but the minute i say okay if you're not afraid of cancer are you afraid of wrinkles are you afraid of fucking yeah. older and then they're like well what do you mean i'm like well yeah if you sunlight makes you look older than you are and it, oh okay we and then they listen a little bit more yeah so if, put on the sunblock just do it it's better for you it's better for you in the long term and um go get yourself checked if you haven't yeah i think it's a good idea that's awesome yeah Cool stuff. I'm going to leave us with don't listen to anybody because that's, I love that. And, believe in uh, yourself. Right? Believe in yourself. So, Henna, thank you for coming on. Thank this you for great. having me. It's great. To ensure that you never miss an episode, subscribe to the show in iTunes or your favorite podcast player. This guarantees that every episode will get delivered directly to your device. To help us get the word out, share with a friend, leave a review, and check out our discussions on the web at go-domain.com slash podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time.